Okay, we should get started. My name is Terry Wilfong. I'm the director of the Kelsey Museum of Archaeology, and I'd like to welcome, welcome you to our event tonight, and thank you all for coming out. It's the opening lecture for the new Kelsey Museum exhibition, Urban Biographies, Ancient and Modern. I will briefly introduce the exhibition and its curator, who will then introduce tonight's speaker. After the lecture, there'll be a reception back at the Kelsey Museum of Archaeology, and I'd like to encourage you to join us. I'd like to thank Don Johnson and Kathy Person, who organized tonight's event. The exhibition we're here to celebrate, Urban Biographies, Ancient and Modern, explores three ancient sites, Nodion, Gabi, and Olynthos, that are currently under investigation by the University of Michigan Archaeological Projects. The exhibition goes on to explore how these sites and the techniques used for their investigation can be applied to studying present-day Detroit. The Kelsey Museum of Archaeology is devoted to the study of the ancient past, and this exhibition shows how contemporary technology can be used to accomplish this goal. But the exhibition also shows how archaeology is not just about the past, but has relevance to the present and to the future. This exhibition also features the most adventurous uses of technology in a Kelsey Museum exhibition to date for a fresh and vital look at a provocative series of questions. Many people contributed to the exhibition. There's a very long list of acknowledgments in the exhibition itself, and I'd encourage you to take a look. I'll just single out our exhibition designers and preparators, Scott Meyer and Emily Puritini, who not only came up with a wonderful design, but also implemented a very complicated installation. But this exhibition is very much the vision of its curator, Christopher Rette. Chris is professor of archaeology in the Department of Classical Studies and in History of Art. He is also the director of the field project at Nodion. He's the guest curator for the exhibition, along with his collaborators, Lisa Nevitt and Nick Terranato in Classical Studies, and Kathy Velikov in the School of Architecture, along with a long list of additional collaborators, many of whom are here tonight, whom Chris will acknowledge. So I'd like to introduce you, Chris Rite, who will introduce this evening's speaker. Do I have to hold the microphone, or is there? Has, OK. Thank you, Professor Wilfong, very much. And let me begin by joining Professor Wil Wilfong in welcoming all of you to this festive occasion. I'm pleased to see many Kelsey regulars, students, uh, staff and faculty, colleagues, docents, and members of the museum, as well as some newcomers, and I want to extend a special welcome to members of the Oakland Avenue Urban Farm community. It's great to see you here in Ann Arbor. As Professor Wil Wilfong said, my main job this evening is to introduce our featured speaker, but I'm going to take advantage of the opportunity to make a few uh, prefatory remarks. First, I want to re-emphasize that the exhibition that we have come together to celebrate was a collaborative effort. I am the person standing on the stage at the moment, but in reality, I am only one member of a team. Indeed, one of the goals of this show was to provide an opportunity for my colleagues in classical studies, professors Lisa Nevitz and Nicola Terranato, to participate in an exhibition at the museum. They are the curators of the portions of the show on the Linthos in Greece and Gabii in Italy, respectively. In addition to featuring current and ongoing Kelsey-sponsored field projects and classical lands, the exhibition compares the ancient cities we study with our nearest contemporary metropolitan neighbor, Detroit, and that provided the happy opportunity to reach beyond the confines of classical studies and archaeology to the College of Architecture and Urban Planning, personified by Professor Kathy Velikoff, the curator of the section of the show in Detroit. So may I now ask Professors Nevitt, Terranato, and Velikoff, please to stand so that the audience can see who you are. A number of other uh, contributors to the exhibition are named in the acknowledgement uh, panel on the show, as Professor Wilfong mentioned, among them the entire staff of the Kelsey Museum, including especially the exhibition designers, Scott Meyer and Emily Pierrettini, the editor, Leslie Schramer, and the graphic artist, Laureen Sterner. 
as well as many of the graduate students in the interdepartmental program in classical art and archaeology, especially Matt Naglak and Zoe Ortiz, and the staffs of the various projects featured in the show, including the Oakland Avenue Urban Farm. On behalf of the entire curatorial team, thank you all very much for your invaluable contributions to this exhibition. Those of us who devote our professional lives to the study of the past often look to the present for clues to understanding distant historical events and realities. Conversely, we think that it is a central part of our mission to show how the past can also be helpful in understanding the present and planning for the future. In showing, for example, how some of the challenges that cities face today have repeatedly been faced by urban communities in the past and that history offers not just one, but a broad variety of possible responses to such dilemmas. To give just one example, while the administrative boundaries of Detroit have remained unchanged for generations, the population has declined by nearly two thirds, leading to very high vacancy rates and a substantial increase in the per capita cost of running the city. Costs the same amount to keep the street lights on, no matter how many people are living in the neighborhood. By the same token, all the ancient towns we have looked at in this exhibition were fortified, and the presence of defensive walls could put walled cities in a similarly difficult bind. It is very hard to redraw the lines of your fortifications, but it takes the same number of soldiers to guard the walls, no matter how the population waxes and wanes. Another reality of which we are very conscious today is the often delicate balance between urban life and the natural resources on which cities depend, such as their water supplies, as the Flint water crisis showed us here in Southeast Michigan very dramatically. Here too, the study of the past has much to offer, and that is one of the reasons why I was thrilled when tonight's speaker, Felix Pierzon, suggested a lecture on the topic of ecology uh, in the ancient city. So let me now just say a few words about Professor Pierzon before handing the lectern over to him. Felix Pierzon is director of the Istanbul branch of the German Archaeological Institute and director of the German excavations at Pergamon in Turkey, posts he has held since 2006. I've known Professor Pierzon ever since he took up his job in Istanbul. The director of the local branch of the German Archaeological Institute is in many ways the dean of the community of foreign archaeologists working in Turkey. And I and all my colleagues in that community are very grateful for the leadership Professor Pierzon has shown in that role. It is an honor and a pleasure to welcome Felix Pierzon to the University of Michigan. Yes, dear Professor Rate, distinguished audience, uh, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to give this lecture in occasion of the exhibition on urban biographies at the Kelsey Museum, which compares, as you know, three ancient cities with modern Detroit. Uh, within the given time frame, I won't be able to add Pergamon as a fifth example and present place and project in the same depth as Gabii, Notion and Olynthos. But I would like to refer to some aspects highlighted in the exhibition, which can serve as links between our work at Pergamon, which is situated close to the western coast of modern Turkey, just 70 miles north of Notion, um, and the approach to ancient cities promoted in the Kelsey show. One link are urban biographies, which are the focus of the exhibition. Like the biographies of individuals, they are always unique. Urban biographies consist of two main elements. Settlement history covers the development of a city in a diachronic perspective, while the physical appearance and the individual character of a city needs to be reconstructed for single stages of its history. Such urban physiognomies are major points of interest of our current research at Pergamon. This is particularly valid for Hellenistic and Roman Imperial Pergamon and for the transformation period in between. 
Within the broad scope of urban biographies, the Kelsey exhibition raises the question, I quote, what do the biographies of these ancient urban centers reveal about how their citizens responded to stress and change, end quote. Stress and change can be caused by many factors, as we all know, among them natural ones such as flood, floods or earthquakes, or less spectacular, but with uh, more far-reaching consequences, a climate change as a whole. Research on human environmental relations is no novelty to archaeology at all, but it doesn't play a major role in the study of urban centers from the Greek or Roman world so far. Hence my paper argues for a systematic inclusion of ecological issues in the analysis and interpretation of ancient cities. In a definition by Hans-Jörg Küster, I quote, ecology explores changes in nature and hence also in creatures. We need ecology in order to understand change and stability in the world, how dynamics function and how the relation between culture and nature can be assessed." End quote. In the light of this definition, ecological aspects ought to be of major concern in the analysis and interpretation of the past. Accordingly, interdisciplinary archaeology has used methods such as pollen analysis or sedimentology for the reconstruction of historical landscapes already for a long time. Today, landscape surveys, as well as urban excavation projects in the ancient Mediterranean, conducted by classical archaeologists, together with many other disciplines, increasingly include environmental issues too. What is still lacking in classical archaeology, however, is comprehensive research, which combines the reconstruction of historical landscapes, the examination of their formation and their use with the analysis of the perception of the natural environment in various media, including architectures and landscapes. Such an interdisciplinary approach focuses on mutual interdependencies between nature and culture and includes ecological relations in the analysis of spaces and material culture of the so-called classical world. It is not my intention to develop uh, a respective research strategy here in detail or even to present any conclusive results. I will rather use the Hellenistic capital of Pergamon as an example for the potential of an ecological approach towards the urban, urban centers as parts of micro-regions. These are not primarily geographical entities but dynamic interaction spaces between humans and the natural environment. In case of Pergamon, which is located here, the lower Kai Kos Valley, it's today the Bakel Chai, uh, the adjacent mountains to the south and the north, um, and the coastal zone with the opening of the river Kai Kos and the Kane uh, Peninsula constituted the microregion. First, the layout of Hellenistic Pergamon. Here you see an idea of Pergamon in the uh, second century AD, but it's basically uh, the Hellenistic layout. Will be discussed as an example of how the development of new aesthetic solutions in urban planning were stimulated by a creative engagement with natural topography. In this context, we will also consider the relation between a group of Hellenistic grave mounds and the city hill. Secondly, I will look at the interdependence between human action, environmental change and settlement history at Elia, located down here, um, the main harbour of Pergamon. And finally, the focus will be on a modest cult place integrated in a rock formation alongside a main street at Pergamon, which stands for the integration as well as for the reshaping of natural features in an urban context. <coughs> the city of Pergamon is located on a hill 340 meters high with a commanding position at the northern margin of a fertile river basin. The earliest settlement goes back to the second millennium BC 
but the city gained supra-regional importance only after it became the seat of the Attalid dynasty in the 3rd century BC. Thanks to an alliance with Rome, Pergamon was one of the important political players in the Eastern Mediterranean before the kingdom fell to Rome as a legacy in 133 BC. During the 2nd century BC, the Attalids, that's the name of the ruling dynasty, made Pergamon an internationally acknowledged cultural center which aimed to resemble Athens. The opus magnum of the Pergamene sculptors, the great altar of Zeus here in a reconstruction and here one of the pieces um, at Berlin, uh, is regarded as a milestone of visual imagery and antiquity. The same can be said about the prospect of the city within the history of urban design. The extensive use of terraces like the big gymnasium here or the theater terrace over there, which were indispensable due to the steep slopes of the city hill, crowned by rich architectures, produced an extrovert appearance of the city when viewed from the surrounding plain. The creation of spectacular vistas within the borders of single terraces, such as here the sanctuary of Dionysus or the theater uh, terrace, or this is spectacular vistas within a terrace, or in between, between the altar of Zeus and the temple of Athena, um, had always been regarded as a particularly progressive quality of Pergamenian architecture. It made Pergamon an exception among Hellenistic urban planning, which was still dominated by orthogonal layouts in a late classical tradition. In the 1990s, however, when orthogonal city planning and its social-political impacts were a very popular topic among architectural historians and archaeologists, Pergamon II received a hypothetically reconstructed regular street grid. It appeared as a triumph of planning force over nature, or the natural topography, but at the same time seemed to be somehow inconsistent with the more organic orientation of building terraces on the Acropolis, and you see the terraces here of the uh, Upper Agora, the Altar of Zeus, um, the Athena Temple, and the later added uh, Roman Trajaneum. They are much more organic at following the topography than uh, this very rigid, regular grid. However, new investigations of the last 10 years have shown that the hypothetical reconstruction of Pergamon's Hellenistic street grid can no longer be maintained. We have to acknowledge instead that the available evidence points to a less regular and more flexible system which, apart from providing a convincing infrastructure for the difficult terrain, highlights the spectacular topography of the city hill by dynamic axes. Oops, they are indicated. These are these dynamic axes and here at the eastern slope it looks more regular, but still it's not a grid. Yeah, it follows the topography and this is even clearer <coughs> at the western slope. And these axes are in some cases linked with important public buildings from the Hellenistic period, such as the great gymnasium on the eastern slope or the theater terrace on the western one. Together with the fan-shaped orientation of building terraces on the um, Acropolis, which also follows the natural terrain, the new reconstruction of the street system seems to be part of a consistent aesthetic concept which used the extraordinary topography of the city hill for the creation of meaningful visual relations within the city and for the projection of the city into its territory by impressive prospects. In this case, the natural topography of the city hill stimulated new, is, new urbanistic solutions which had a major influence on the communication between the city and its surroundings. Such mutual relations of cities and landscapes within the settings of the microregion contributed a lot to the physiognomies of individual polis. However, 
the, rela the relation between the city and its mostly rural hinterland, and here you see a view from the Acropolis to the west, um, the relation uh, between the city and its mostly rural hinterland was not one-dimensional with an exclusive focus on the urban center of Pergamon. Recent studies have shown that the micro-region Pergamon functioned also as a coherent visual region linked by points of interest such as grave mounds or sanctuaries. In times of the fully developed visual region, an imaginary inhabitant of Pergamon in the first century BC could perceive the landscape as stage of his or her own past and at the same time as sphere of divine and luminous powers. This resulted in a durable attachment to the landscape on various rational and emotional levels, which must have been influenced his or her appreciation of history and nature in general. In this context, tumuli, or the grave mounds, were ideal markers both in a flat terrain and on top of natural hills thanks to their genuine shape. As such, they were perceived in passing or were included in panoramic views. As burials, cenotaphs or memorials, they were linked to, a specific, to specific persons or events and hence able to tell stories about ancestors or powerful members of the society. Placed in a landscape, they could symbolize ancestral connections between specific places and territorial claims at the same time. And um, I show as the example the biggest tumulus, the so-called Yima Tepe, which has a height to the ground level of more than 30 meters. And you see two colleagues here on top as a relation of the size. And here at the back side, you see the Acropolis Hill of Pergamon. And so if you um, travel to Pergamon from the coast, from Elia, you approximately have this view. So it's very clear that the Yima Tepe is a kind of visual overture of the um, city hill. The city hill of Pergamon, shown again here, um, is, was surrounded from southwest to east by at least 11 tumuli, shown here, which apart from one exception from the Roman imperial age, can be dated more or less convincingly to the Hellenistic period. This is the third to the first century BC. Concerning the positioning of the tumuli around the city hill, two options were favored. They were either placed on exposed hilltops like the Ilia Steppe or the Kula Bayere, um, which resulted in a high visibility even from great distances despite minor heights of the mount, mounts themselves. Or they were piled up in the flat plain of the alluvial uh, fan of River Selinus, such as Yima Tepe, just seen um, before, where they were easily recognizable against the non-built-up terrain. Two viewsheds created on the basis of satellite imagery and archaeological finds by Bernhard Ludwig show how Tumuli significantly contributed to the integration of Pergamon and the surrounding landscape within one visual region. Um, these U-sheds, they function like um, you have a position where the U-shed is taken from, it's called your position one, and everything which is marked in black is visible from this position here. So you see Tumuli like Yima Tepe, Mal Tepe, uh, the Kula Baile and the Ilya Tepe, but also uh, at least the western part of the city hill were visible from this um, position. Two imaginary travelers approaching Pergamon from southwest, and this is position one, or northeast, position two, um, could spot most of the tumuli together with the city hill. City hill and tumuli were linked in a lens were also linked in landscape panoramas creating dynamic axes pointing to the extension of the territory of Pergamon um, this photograph is taken from position 2 and you see here the acropolis hill here the tumulus on Ilia steppe the tumulus on the kula Baire, the tafshan teppe and if we could go more in this direction you would see yima teppe here quite prominently 
So you have a kind of dynamic line going basically um, from northeast to southwest and linking the city hill and its uh, panorama with these points. And this creates the impression of uh, an idea that Pergamon is not just up here, but in it extends uh, to a larger territorial area. After our two travelers had climbed the Acropolis of Pergamon, the tumuli appeared to them from a completely different perspective. Even taking into account the limited field of vision from a built-up urban context, most of the mounds were visible from the terrace of the Athena sanctuary. Uh, the position is now taken from here, and these areas are not visible due to the architecture, but all the rest in black is visible, and you can see that most, basically all of the tumuli are included in uh, the viewshed. Um, they, the tumuli, became significant features of a panorama reaching from south, uh, from northeast, Kulabayre, um, to southwest, uh, the Ixtepe here, and at the same time represented human agency related to Pergamon. Together, they provided the elements which could be combined by individual viewers in their own networks of meaning. The visual region of Pergamon, however, reached far beyond the tumuli and included conspicuous rock formations such as Kalerga Tepe or ancient Teutrania, Teutrania, which is the legendary predecessor of Pergamon in the Caicos Valley, as recently shown in a um, remarkable study by Christina Williamson. From there, uh, from Teutrania, the visual network expanded up to Elia, the main port city of Pergamon. You can see here uh, the coast, and here approximately Elia is um, located. Um, the main port of Pergamon and the Etelids, located about 15 miles southwest of Pergamon, not far away from the river mouth of the Caicos. Apart from the basin of the closed harbor and its mobile, which you can see here, um, hardly any ancient structures are preserved on the surface. It was the aim of our interdisciplinary research project to understand how the older harbor city Elia was shaped in Hellenistic times according to the needs of Pergamon as capital of a rising kingdom. In order to include human nature interaction in our analysis, the historical environment, its exploitation and its dynamic changes over time have been studied too. In this context, geoarchaeology as a subdiscipline of physical geography has gained much importance recently. By a great variety of methods, among them evaluation of profiles obtained by deep drilling, which you can see here on the image, historical landscape scenarios can be explored in detail. The hypothetical reconstruction drawing based on the results of interdisciplinary research between archaeology, geophysics and geoarchaeology shows a fortified settlement with an astonishingly long waterfront of about 1000 meters compared to the rather small um, settled area. A closed harbor again here, a fortified harbour front which obviously included ship sheds and then again a fortified beach so, uh, sh uh, zone for shipyards um, which could be used for shipyards or as a temporary landing for elite fleets can be assumed on the basis of our survey data. These elements do not indicate an organic development of the city but strong Pergamenian influence, which can also be detected in various other features such as building technique, military technology or pottery production. With the end of the Etelid Kingdom, settlement activities decreased at Elia in the 1st century BC, then became more dynamic again in the 2nd century AD, parallel to the situation at Pergamon, and finally ended in early Byzantine period. On this basis, 
both the appearance of Elia in Hellenistic times and its development over time could be sufficiently inter interpreted by its dependence from Pergamon. This, however, would be a much too limited perspective and perception. Geoarchaeological studies by a team from Cologne University have shown that the slow decrease of the city is paralleled by changing coastlines and the siltation of the harbor. Also here you see the changing coastlines. That was the situation about 2500 BC, 300 BC, under the Hellenistic period, and then here 500 AD when the basin was completed, uh, silted up. And this is such a coring profile, which looks like an elegant variation in gray, but tells the colleagues from the geoarchaeology uh, geoarchaeology, many interesting details. Um, the reconstruction, or, um, also it leads to the siltation of the harbor. This, however, was not a purely natural event. The reconstruction of the flora on the basis of pollen analysis and many other data indicate that one source of sediments was erosion caused by the abandonment of formerly cultivated land after the Hellenistic period. The last period of the city's existence in the 4th to 7th century AD is characterized by the reuse of building material taken from the city walls and else there, there for the erection of an extended seawater saline, which is still visible today in the shallow water of the Silted Bay. Um, and you see the structures here, which are the man-made structures and further structures over there. The salines uh, stretched over a distance of approximately 1.5 miles, other, here you see them on a, uh, on a map, and can be compared with contemporary structures known, for instance, from Trapani at Sicily. After the harbour as raison d'être for Elia had ceased to function due to partly man-made environmental change, humans searched for new resources to exploit, such as salt, in an altered landscape. Additionally to the interpretation of Elia's urban history with a focus on its dependence on Pergamon, particularly during the Hellenistic period, the geoarchaeological approach offers a complementary line of argument which convincingly explains the changes over time on the level of mutual human environment interactions. If the traditional archaeological historical approach is combined with geoarchaeological methods, a detailed picture emerges of the events and factors which formed the urban and rural landscape between 2,300 and 1,300 years ago at the Bay of Elia. This example shows how the ecological analysis and interpretation contributes to a more complex understanding of urban history and prevents monocausal and simplistic assessments. Returning to Pergamon, the role of religion in the development of spatial and aesthetic practices involving nature shall be highlighted in the last part of my paper. The close relation between nature and religion in antiquity is a commonplace. It is materialized in the choice of scenic location for sanctuaries and in the worship of natural features such as springs, groves, caves or mountain tops. In our context, the so-called natural sanctuaries are of particular interest. The definition is problematic, but generally a non-monumentalized sanctuary with a natural feature as primary recipient of worship can be described as natural. Such natural sanctuaries are normally based in the rural sphere and hence have been associated with simplicity or even poverty and worshippers from the lower strata of the rural population, such as shepherds. Recently, this romanticizing image derived from bucolic literature has been strongly criticized. The natural sanctuaries are now understood as expressions of religious structures and needs rather than as reflections of social hierarchies. A good example of a natural sanctuary from the Hellenistic period is Kapakaya, 
five kilometers northwest of Pergamon. It consists of spectacular rock formations shown here um, and a spring but has few architectural additions. There is evidence for the artificial support of the spring by a water basin. This shows that the appearance of a seemingly natural phenomenon uh, was more important than its originality. From the votive offerings excavated at Kapakaya, no exclusive divine recipient can be identified, but the Anatolian goddess Meta Kubile clearly prevails. Since such sanctuaries are normally located outside city walls and hence understood as an expression of the dichotomy between civilization and wilderness, it was a surprise when we discovered several natural sanctuaries within the fortified boundaries of Pergamon. And the blue uh, dots here show these potential natural sanctuaries. Some are clearly identified, some still bear a question mark, and we found them during our surveys on the eastern and the western slope of the hill. And the photograph you can see here is the situation here on the northern uh, eastern slope. All of them are attached to conspicuous rock formations. Apparently, an ensemble of several cult places existed in the northeast part of the city hill in an area which was not suitable for dense settlement due to, rocky, uh, to, due to rocky and craggy terrain and stormy winds. One sanctuary uh, of a, uh, consists of a prominent rock with a postament uh, for a statue and of several terraces with water installations. In another case, a grotto containing a niche for a probably painted cult image and a water basin below formed the center of the sanctuary. Similar to the grave mounds, the inner and extra urban natural sanctuaries contributed to the integration of urban and rural sphere within the visual region of Pergamon. A viewshed taken from the so-called Great Rock Sanctuary East on the eastern slope covers parts of the eastern and the western um, Kaikos Valley and reaches deep into the Aspodenon Mountains. In the center of the visible area, the mountain peak of Mahmutkale uh, becomes visible at a distance of about 18 miles southeast of the city hill. A monumental sanctuary of Meta Aspodene, developed in the Hellenistic times on the basis of an older cult place, was located there. It served as a reference point to the Meta cult at Pergamon and its microregion. When we turn to the natural sanctuaries on the western flank of Pergamon City Hill, different relations become obvious. The viewshed from there covers large parts of the western um, Upper Caicos Valley, but also reach to the north, north as far as uh, Kapekaya, which we have seen before, which occupies an important position in the sacred topography of the landscape north of Pergamon. Together, the viewsheds from the cult places on the eastern and the western slope of the city hill provided a full coverage of all natural sanctuaries in the landscape surrounding Pergamon. If we focus the analysis on linear visual relations between single sanctuaries, it becomes evident that they contributed to the visual region by creating a network which is based on visibility and common religious knowledge. Such a network not only strengthened the bounds between countryside and city, but also between nature and culture. In this relation, a uniform rural aesthetic and atmosphere cultivated both inside and outside the city by the Pergamenians is of particular importance. Within the urban physiognomy of Hellenistic Pergamon, the simplicity of the natural sanctuaries becomes particularly obvious in relation to the contemporary marble architecture. And I'm just showing the Athena sanctuary with the 4th century temple, the 2nd century stoa, and the famous sculptures as a reference. If this um, 
if, if, if this contradiction basically was intentional, it might also explain the absence of sculptures and inscriptions in the natural sanctuaries. The relative plainness of votive offerings and tableware and the usage of portable cooking equipment similar to that known from extra-urban sanctuaries such as Kapekaya. The rural aesthetic of a place such as the Grotto Sanctuary, shown here which lies inside the city, where the entire furnishing has been preserved thanks to its intentional deposition, was achieved by its location in a natural, this means rocky context, simplicity in architectural addition uh, and movable objects and in the performance of ritual cooking and dining and feasting with reference to outdoor activities. The assumption of rural aesthetic uh, for the Hellenistic period is not an ahistorical transfer of the popular modern image of a healthy and simple and at the same time aesthetically refined country life, very successfully merchandised, for instance, by the German magazine Landlust, which might be translated as country delight or even country lust or something like that. Already, Hellenistic poets of the 3rd century uh, BC, such as Kalimachos, Theokritos and Apollonius, praised sweet and lush nature and the simple life of shepherds and peasants. At the same time, bucolic poetry reflects a critical attitude towards urban civilization which led to an idealized construction of nature and country life. Starting in the Hellenistic period, natural elements such as artificial grottoes were increasingly integrated in domestic and sacred contexts within the urban sphere. They testified to the combination of rural aesthetic with the need of a refined urban lifestyle. Another important visual source for the attitudes towards nature and country life in the late Hellenistic and the Augustan period are the so-called sacral idyllic reliefs. They are roughly contemporary with the natural sanctuaries from Pergamon, but mainly come from Italy and belong to the imagery of rich private residences. Accordingly, they have been interpreted as projections of rural felicity which created a self-assuring atmosphere in domestic contexts. From a social-political perspective, the reliefs have also been read as a reflection of the Aurea Aetas, the Golden Age in the reign of Augustus. In our context, however, the sacred idyllic relief highlight another aspect in the perception of idealized nature in the Hellenistic and early Roman imperial period. In most cases, the natural environment is characterized by the presence of rocks here, here, and down there, um, often in combination with trees. This can be partly explained by the pictorial conventions of reliefs in a Greek tradition, but the setting of the rocks is often so prominent that it goes beyond mere background indications of a rural environment. In a relief from Torino, the rock formation structures the pictorial space and provides the scenery for figures and objects. Small shrines are integrated in the rocky landscape, which becomes the true bearer of the rural bucolic and sacred atmosphere. This corroborates the idea of sacral and aesthetic agency of rocks, which is also evident in the case of the natural sanctuaries mentioned above. While the sacral idyllic reliefs are highly artificial constructions for refined domestic contexts, the question arises if aestheticized nature was a phenomenon limited to visual media, domestic spaces and to sacred settings within the natural sanctuaries? Or was the integration of natural features a more widespread element within the urban aesthetic of Hellenistic cities such as Pergamon? And was nature then perceived in a similar way as in the above-mentioned examples from poetry and images, that means inviting and sacral? Alongside a broad-stepped street, which led to the main entrance of the theatre terrace or the um, sanctuary of Dionysus, and hence was probably used for processions, 
another seemingly untouched rock is located within a densely built up area. Clother examination shows that the rock was artificially flattened at some points on the side facing the street, which you can see here, uh, in, a se uh, in a semi natural facade. The street itself is cut from the rock and seemed to broaden slightly in front of the facade. Thereby, a square like spatial structure um, is created, which is dominated by the ensemble of a small niche cut in the facade and a simple altar which can be inferred from a rectangular recess in the rock surface here just below um, the niche and a narrow podium running here slightly higher than street level. This is all very simply made and hardly interferes with the natural appearance of the setting. In their daily routine, the Pergaminians passed the modest cult place on the way to the theatre terrace or to the upper thoroughfare of the western slope of the city hill. Due to gradients of up to 75%, this was not an easy stroll, but a rather exhausting climb, particularly in the summer heat. Thanks to the northwestern orientation, the rock provides shadow most of the day. Therefore, the square-like extension of the step street offered a welcome rest in the shade. This might have been reason enough for a short prayer offering. The 3D visualization of the rock and the street sanctuary in its original urban context shows the perspective of a pedestrian just reaching the level of the square. The niche, originally perhaps with a small offering or cult image, and the alleged altar, are situated in such a way that they immediately could be spotted and had to be passed while proceeding to the theatre terrace. This combination of a rock formation and an altar would have resembled the settings no known from the sacral idyllic reliefs. The striking similarity is further heightened by the presence of a tree, which is of course modern, but might have had an ancient predecessor. Hence, the modest street sanctuary from Pergamon shows that sacred and aestheticized nature was not only a phenomenon known from visual imagery or staged in closed-up natural sanctuary. It became part of the urban physiognomy of the Hellenistic city and could be encountered in daily uh, life routine, which included acts of ephemeral religious practice. In this regard, the rock not only provided shadow, its agency encompassed the materialization of numinous powers and a rural aesthetic which contrasts with the civilized urban environment. Hence, religion and aesthetics operated together as catalysts for the interconnection of culture and nature in the urban sphere. Visually, this interrelationship was configured on three levels, by images such as sacral idyllic reliefs, by the integration and alteration of natural elements in the urban fabric and by visual links between city and countryside with urban and extra-urban natural sanctuaries as important focal points. Interdisciplinary research at Pergamon and its microregion over the last decade has shown that complex human environment interrelations are formative for the individual physiognomies of cities and landscapes. Hence, their study significantly contributes to our knowledge of the past. The presentation of three separate topics in this paper, however, indicates the continuing lack of a more comprehensive research. In the future, a new program on the transformation of city and micro region in the Hellenistic and Roman Pergamon, uh, jointly designed by archaeologists, geographers and other historical and scientific disciplines, building upon the experience of the last decade, hopefully can shed new light on the diachronic development of the interdependencies between culture and nature, if the necessary funding will be granted. This future, potential future project starts with the question of um, what interactions existed between profound urban change in Pergamon marked 
by a doubling of the urban area since the late first century AD and monumental construction methods, methods such as the amphitheater here and changes in the entire microregion. Starting from the observation that the western uh, valley of the Caicos with the adjacent mountain ranges and the coastal zone had been characterized by settlement concentration. Um, all the places here in red do not continue into the Roman imperial age. Also characterized by settlement concentration and demilitarization since the end of the royal period in 133 BC and later in the imperial period by the establishment of otium or wellness elements such as thermal bars or a villa maritima over there. The relationships between cities, rural settlements and the landscapes are to be investigated systematically and diachronically for the first time in the entire microregion. This is done on different levels such as resource use, production and consumption, lifestyle and health of the inhabitants, architecture and construction, as well as the design and perception of habitats. With regard to the diversity of natural resources, the proposed project concentrates on soil, water, wood, stone and clay, whose significance for the economic and living space can only understood through direct cooperation between archaeology, building research and physical geography. Finally, a complex socio-ecological modeling of the transformation of the Pergamon microregion as a contribution to a better understanding of the dynamic human-environment relationship and its reception in landscape design, urban development and architecture will be created, uh, inshallah. Although socio-ecological relations have to be researched on a micro level, broader thematic approaches are needed as well. They could go beyond the still relatively few studies on the environmental history of antiquity available so far, which summarize our knowledge on ecological issues in the Greek and Roman world. These studies often stress the absence of environmentalism in antiquity, but do not consistently combine the physical, the active and the reflective level in order to gain a more comprehensive idea of the significance of ecology for ancient life. In this respect, there is still potential for an ecological turn in classical archaeology. Thank you.